seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling the February 3rd, 2022 meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or, or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, at this time, I'm going to call the roll call to make sure everyone can be heard and we can hear everyone. Um, so I'm going to start with Shalini. Present. And Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. So we are all present. Um, there are, we're going to move right into our agenda. We have Rob here, which is excellent because that's one of the first things on our items, but we're going to take care of one thing first. We're going to change the order of the agenda today for a little bit. We're going to do the calendar and then we're going to do article 14. Um, and then if we have public, we'll take public comment. If not, um, we will move to the transition memo. And if there wasn't public bef between those two to make public comment, we'll try again after the transition memo is done. Um, and then we'll do announcements. We do not have minutes today to um, adopt. Um, hopefully we will have all of our outstanding minutes by the next meeting in February. Um, with that, we're gonna start with the adoption of the 2022 regular meeting calendar. Um, that was in your packet. Uh, are there any requested changes to that calendar? I am not seeing any, so I... Yeah, I didn't see it in the packet. Somehow or other, I missed it, but I will, I'm not too concerned. I can yeah, put it I didn't, I, I did not see it either. Hmm. Let me put it up on the screen. Thank you. So that's the list. It averages approximately two per month. Um, think. And um, the there's an issue in November um, because we're on Thursdays and TSO, I believe, has adopted a Thursday calendar, um, I think. Um, there's one Thursday, obviously, we can't use. So, so we and TSO will work out a November schedule when we okay. get there pending um who's got business type thing um shalini yeah i think we already decided we'd give it to you um because we thought crc is more important than we are i mean than tso is so i think we give it to them give it to you all already yeah well we're gonna put it on here and yeah. we'll see I'll, I'll talk to the chair dorothy um when we get closer to see who might mm -hmm. need it more depending on who's got the the thing right. but but we'll have exactly. to deal with november then um, right. And then, um, just so you know, I put the town room, although that one changed to March 31st, town room for, um, so that one should say virtual for March 31st right now, given our vote. Um, but, um, so I'll change that, but town room after that because of our vote, and I don't believe there's been any passage of any extension of anything, so that at the state level um, that might allow us to do something. Um, but that's why it says town room at this point due to active votes. So I'll fix the one for March 31st. At some point, it probably said April something. <laughs> so um, any other requested changes or anything? No. So I'm going to make the motion to adopt the CRC meeting schedule as I'm going to say amended to amend that March 31st one to virtual. Um, is there a second? Second. I second. Okay, thank you. Is there any other further discussion? Seeing none, um, I'm just going to run up. Oh, Shalini? You, just, uh, you did run this by Dorothy, right? Yes. Because we have a set calendar from... And I didn't get a chance to look at this, so I haven't compared the calendar, but I'm, get, I'm assuming you've done that. She had this one when she made up hers. Okay, okay there you go. Yes, yes. Okay, there you go. Thank you. So we did confer. Um, 
Seeing no other comments, we're going to take a vote. Um, we're going to start with Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. A Jennifer. Aye. And Sh and Shalini. Yes. Okay. So that is adopted um, unanimously. That then takes us to our first action item, which for the day will be Article 14 temporary zoning. Is, it's not an action item, sorry, it's a discussion item. Um, we're gonna start with Article 14 temporary zoning um, and there is going to be a general discussion. I've asked Rob Moore to join us for this discussion um, and to do a brief sort of speaking not not any formal presentation but speak briefly about his thoughts of on um what has worked well not worked well or what he would potentially like to see made permanent as we start this conversation um for those who are new to crc this was a carryover measure in a sense that as um as many people know we adopted a new effective date at the end of last year um, so that it is effect, well, not effective, um, uh, end date, a sunset date of at the end of last year where we extended it a year to the end of this year. CRC, when they were holding their hearing and discussion on making that recommendation, um, thought it if things were going to be made permanent, that that discussion should happen sooner and the sooner rather than later because zoning amendments take time to um, be done. And that, um, so start that conversation early so that there is no rush at the end of the year to either have to extend this again um, so that that can happen or, um, you know, be rushing to have those hearings for anything that might be made permanent. The thought was if anything is going to be made permanent that it be integrated into the actual zoning bylaw instead of within this Article 14. That was the conversation that happened last December and November when we were dealing with the extension. Um, so this is the start of a new council, a new committee. Um, so we're trying to start that conversation early to see where things may or may not go. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob um, to give us an update and uh, thoughts on his um, on what, if anything, he would like to do with this temporary zoning article and any further changes. So Rob. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> just a little reminder about how this developed. Uh, it was mid 2020 when we brought the initial idea to the council and uh, it was adopted for six months. Uh, we then extended it for the full year of 21. And then uh, once again, as Mandy mentioned for 22, um, to date, we've issued about 30 of these uh, uh, Article 14 permits, which um, most of them would have otherwise been a special permit. There's a few of those that might have been site plan review with the planning board, but most of those uh, special permits. In fact, it included nine new food and drink establishments. Uh, so, you know, we we feel like it really accomplished a lot and, and came in at a time that it was uh, really needed. So for that, it worked really well. Uh, the initial language of the bylaw uh, included uh, the ability to expand or create new retail, personal care establishment, or food and drink establishments. It also included the ability to uh, have accessory uses that are associated with those, such as outdoor dining, live entertainment, or uh, even a drive through facility if needed. Uh, and it was pretty much limited to that scope. And then, at, you know, as COVID, you know, went on and we started to anticipate what might be needed. Uh, we, in the, the first extension, uh, amended the language to add uh, medical uses and temporary uses. And I'll talk a little bit more about temporary uses in a little bit. Uh, so, you know, we've had mostly um, special, which, what would have been special permit uh, projects um, that were able to be accomplished in a, a relatively short period of time and expense to the applicant. Uh, I'm going to start talking about temporary uses, uh, and this is moving right into, um, you know, possible considerations for permanent changes to the bylaw. Uh, I have two that I am recommending. Uh, the first one is temporary uses, and this isn't really a new 
um, struggle for us with the bylaw. We've, we've never had the ability in the bylaw to authorize temporary uses and for years been, um, been noting how it would be nice to have that language in the bylaw. And in you know, non-COVID related times, you know, this could be something like a farm that would like to um, offer the, their, their site, their property to a, a caterer, to a restaurant, to uh, a music event for a, a day or weekend event. And we've been asked about this many, many times and never had the ability to permit it. So we, you know, we, we never took any effort. And I think all of you know, things happen, weddings, all kinds of things happen around places. Uh, we never, you know, took any effort to stop things from happening, but we could never say that you could actually do this and give them the authorization and work with them to do that, make sure they have proper toilets and lighting and, you know, really be involved with the process where it would be nice to be able to do that. Uh, what we found through the Article 14, there, there were other uses for uh, other examples of where temporary uses could be useful, uh, whether it's setting up uh, the kiosk at CVS for testing and vaccines or uh, tents at the library, services and activities happening outdoors, something that might go on for months at a time, uh, as long as months at a time, but with the, uh, the intention of returning back to its original condition or state when that, that time was over. Uh, so my suggestion would be that we uh, look at the possibility of incorporating temporary use provisions, possibly some criteria uh, that would uh, go along with those, and it could be something that's introduced into Article 3 probably pretty nicely. Um, should I just continue, Mandy, or do you want to talk about that first? Or Let, Let's continue and hear them all, and then, and then we can ask questions and discuss and and okay. All. So the other one is food and drink establishments. Uh, and in this again, uh, I'll say isn't new. Uh, you know, I've, I've certainly been saying uh, that I've, I felt uh, in recent years that uh, we didn't need to have special permits for food and drink establishments. Uh, I think we've gotten really good at permitting these. We have a very robust inspection program with health, fire, building inspectors, uh, that work with these establishments, our, our permit administrator that uh, works through a lot of issues, our uh, licensing coordinator uh, that works with the Board of License Commissioners to ensure that you know, proper ID checking equipment is, is in the establishment. Uh, so we, we've gotten really good at all of the things that I see the Zoning Board of Appeals um, case after case you know, review and and uh, put as conditions to permits and work through um, the normal set, I would say, of uh, either issues or potential impacts of the businesses in the particular areas and think that we could probably do this, you know, as a, as a staff, uh, you know, uh, administrative approval in most cases, uh, you know, leaving the, the work for the board's to be when there's really new development, new buildings, new parking lots being proposed, but restaurants coming and going in existing spaces, I feel like we could handle this with a, a good list of criteria in the bylaw. Uh, and like I said, it's um, you know the nine, nine examples of new establishments. And then there's another, I don't know, 10 or 12 of uh, existing establishments that have expanded during this time under Article 14. Some of them have been ex significant expansions. Uh, the spoke doubled in size of their capacity. Stackers has added a nice outdoor uh, patio uh, behind their property that you can't see unless you actually walk behind it, but it's worth checking out. Um, we've done some, uh, some modifications at the hangar uh, pub. So there's just a, a nice list of, of good work that's happened out of Article 14. Uh, even with the existing businesses. And there's eight pending uh, applications under Article 14 right now. Six of those are food and drink establishments. Uh, so, you know, I, and, I, and I do want to say that I think we should look at this, but we also need to be careful about a couple things uh, when we do get into uh, considering and, and possibly if we are drafting language to amend the bylaw. Um, just to remind everyone that our bylaw is, uh, is inclusive with its use classification. So um, 
in 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 most bylaws, if the use classification is not listed in the bylaw, it's prohibited. That's not the way our bylaw works. Our bylaw lists a, a, has a long list of use classifications, and then it says whatever else is proposed. It's my job to figure out which classification it most look closely relates to, and that establishes the permitting path for that use. So we do want to think about things in our bylaw that um, you know aren't specifically addressed in a use classification. That might be something like a high uh, high uh, capacity performance venue. Uh, it might even be a, a certain capacity of a bar or nightclub. Um, I, I bring up from time to time uh, adult entertainment. You know, we don't have that as a use classification in our bylaw. And if somebody brought that forward, I have to choose where that goes. So when we're thinking about making the, reducing the special permit requirement, we wanna make sure we have a place for these use classifications that really need to be regulated by special permit uh, where that discretionary power is still available. Uh, and not just administrative approval. So just, you know, just as a caution, if we chose to move forward with that discussion, I'd want to get into um, some of those items uh, just to at least work through to decide if we should be making other adjustments and making sure we have places in the bylaw where those those other uses might, might um, sit. And just as an example, the Drake um, that you're all aware of, uh, I had to pick a place for that. We don't have a performance venue classification. So, you know, I chose to put that in the food and drink establishment. Maybe I chose to try to make that work a little harder because it was allowed under Article 14. And then that would make the process move quicker and um, less costly to the applicant. But there really wasn't another place to put it. You know, there's, you know, there's a classification for arcades and bowling alleys. You know, that didn't seem to be the best fit. Um, so there, you know, there, there just there wasn't a, a really neat place to put that. So um, that ended up being treated as a food and drink establishment. Uh, so there could be, you know, other examples of that in the future that we just want to think a little bit about. So those are my two suggestions that are, are worth consider to me are worth considering. Um, I do want to say that the reason why I'm not suggesting other ones like retail and personal care establishments is that those are allowed by site plan review almost in every district. I think there might be a couple of odd cases in the BN, but you know, most of us don't really think much of the BN anyway, district uh, that require it by special permit. Uh, so in a site plan review use, we already have administrative approval uh, built into the bylaw when there's no major exterior change to the building or the site. So that already works really well. So if there's a, a retail establishment going into a storefront that already exists, even if they need to change the door, put up a sign, maybe some light fixtures, uh, we can deal with that without having to go through the lengthy permitting process uh, with the planning board in that case. Uh, so this would, you know, these other examples of food and drink establishments might align more with how we handle the site plan review waiver and administrative approval. Um, then I think the last one that we added in was medical uses. And I do feel like that's really specific to COVID um, and it's doing its job and has helped out in a couple of really important situations, but uh, probably not needed for long-term uh, change to the bylaw, at least at this point. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, I feel like this extension of Article 14 really should be the end of it. Um, you know, this is temporary zoning and it'll be two and a half years. I think if we go much further, we start to really raise the question, is this temporary zoning anymore? Uh, so we want to be careful of that uh, either, you know, as we come throughout the year, you know, we really would want to look at making significant changes to the temporary zoning if we were thinking of continuing it, or ideally we would be incorporating maybe some permanent changes as you're talking about today. Thank you for that, Rob. Um, are there any questions for Rob uh, at this time or, or comments or discussion? We don't have to limit it to just questions. Well, I'll ask one. Um, um, Pam, you can go first. 
I'm trying to vainly define my cursor to, to raise my hand. Um, I had a couple questions and, and that was more uh, when I think of some of the temporary uses that might be helpful um, under, under affected uses. Um, I was thinking funeral establishments and veteran potential other entities that, that could have used some facilitation, I guess, for, for you know, ease of, ease of treating patients, treating, you know, incoming um, clients. Um, and then in the accessory uses, uh, actually then in the temporary uses, again, I was actually really surprised that there wasn't a recreation and daycare because those two seemed like really um, that could really benefit from that that outside kiosk or the or the temporary tent kind of a thing. And I just wondered why those hadn't been included in the um, in that consideration. Rob. Yeah. So we uh, we did include government purpose uses, uh, which I thought would have covered our recreational areas that are town controlled uh, for, for temporary uses. Um, the other, um, thing is that the, the recreational and, um, public use spaces are allowed by right. So they're, they're guest classifications or site plan review classifications. And as I mentioned, there's already a process for, um, through the site plan review uses, minor alterations to a site. So a, a kiosk on a large recreational area, in my mind, would be rel would be small. Uh, so I think I would have normally, even before all this happened, would have considered that uh, as administrative approval or, or waiver to site plan review anyway. Got it. Thank you, Rob. What about, about the funeral establishments and the vet and the vet? Uh, yeah, yeah. We didn't. We did not. We didn't uh, consciously exclude those, you know, from the, the consideration, but we didn't, we did not think to include those or um, a lot of what we were recommending and proposing in the amendment was based on what we were actually dealing with and work the yeah. establishments we were working with and thinking of what we should, you know, everyone was asking, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear from any funeral homes. <laughs> uh, you know, I heard from, from investors of rental properties and all kinds of people, but not, you know, and we, they didn't all make the list. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Pam. And thanks, Rob. So I'm going to ask my question, which is, um, you know, to me, this sounds great for changes to, to the bylaws, because, you know, over the last two and a half years, we've heard that it's worked well. There haven't been complaints about those administrative, the food and drink establishments you have administratively approved um, and all. And if they're going into existing buildings, um, in some sense, to me, it makes sense. But the question I have is um, more practical, which is sort of next steps. Are you looking for CRC to say, go forward with it? And if so, who's the one working on these changes? Um, and is there capacity in the department to get it done sometime in the next year, since, since there's a desire to not extend temporary zoning beyond this coming December? Um, from my standpoint, yes, I'm asking to, for the CRC or, you know, anyone who wants to take this on to consider these changes, uh, and working to incorporate them as permanent changes. I'll also ask Chris to help comment on staff capacity, because I think that's an ongoing discussion and, uh, you know, tasks that keep coming up for staff. Um, I'm not sure that's all resolved or can even be answered today, but, um, I think it, you know, from my perspective, we'd want to we'd we want to help as much as we can to to accomplish this. Chris, um, so in terms of Article Fourteen, Rob has taken the lead. You know, he's drafted the two um, amendments that we've had, and so I'm I'm not really entirely sure of what would be involved in drafting more. But I'm assuming Rob would have a large um, part of it. And so I would count on him to, you know, do a lot of that work. I'm not, a, I'm not thinking that it's going to require, you know, a tremendous amount of work on the part of um, planning staff, either graphically or creating text. Um, I could be wrong about that. So maybe Rob could describe a little more about what he's thinking. So, yeah, I think what we need is um, 
we need Article Three, the table, to be uh, adjusted under the food and drink establishment category. We have uh, Class One, Two, and Three. Uh, you know, so I think there's a, you know, we need to evaluate whether or not we need the the multiple classes of food and drink establishment, and if those are the right classes. Uh, there's criteria that's built into each of those um, that may no longer be needed. And there's new criteria that could be added uh, that is more in line with what we do now when we actually issue these permits. Uh, so I think there's, uh, you know, a, an adjustment to the table. And of course, changing the permitting path from special permit to site plan review, I think would be the recommendation so that they could benef then benefit from that waiver process, that administrative approval process that I mentioned, uh, but not, not um, eliminate the site plan review process for a new establishment that's being built. Mm. Uh, so that's one that I think that would be the restaurants uh, and food and drink establishments. And then the, um, the text, there'd be a, t a, a set of text that would go into Article 3, the earlier uh, portion of Article 3, not in the table that would uh, authorize temporary uses. And, uh, you know, I could see a list of criteria, you know, six to 10 items or something. I think that's relatively easy. Um, you know, it, it, in at least right now, I would say it could probably apply to almost any situation uh, under the right conditions and a permit and limitations and knowing that it re returns back to its original condition. Uh, of course, as we talk about it, maybe there'd be an exception or two that we'd want to work in there, but that'd be text in Article 3. Okay, I'm going to go to Chris, and then I'll recognize Pam and Jennifer. So it's mostly text, and it's not going to be graphics or analysis of how many of these we would have, or density, or um, you know, doing 3D graphics about how big they would be or anything like that. It would just be text. And so I think you know, we could fit that into our work plan for the next year. Um, in addition, is I'm imagining that as a result of this, there would be fewer applications to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that aspect of our work would, you know, maybe diminish a bit and allow us to work on this as well. Thank you for that, Chris. Pam and then Jennifer. Thanks. Um, Rob, could you give some examples of, of the criteria that you're thinking about? You know, you said there might be eight or 10 criteria that you would use. Can you just, what do you mean? For temporary uses, Pam? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for, for temporary uses, I'd want to address uh, items like parking, surfaces, uh, signage, lighting, you know, hours of, you know, when is it shut down and cut off? Um, uh, toilet and hand washing facilities, um, mostly the, you know, pretty basic, you know, public and life safety things that would go along with an event that I'm presuming and, and envisioning that the public would be uh, gathered at. You know, there could be a tent on the on the out in a field or something like that. And uh, so, yeah, those those types of items, and there's probably a few more. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Pam. Jennifer. Thank you. I just, just a kind of general curiosity question. So for your experience over the last year or two, has, has it helped to, sh you know, sort of demonstrate what, um, how we could fast track some, not fast track, but how some of the, when they're not temporary, but as new businesses locate in Amherst, we always hear that it's a very, you know, can be a burdensome process as it probably should be. But has this revealed some areas where we, can loosen maybe some of that process that would make, you know, even doing, you know, opening a business here, perhaps um, more appealing or seem like there's fewer hurdles. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, yeah, I do. I think it, it showed, it, it's, it's shown a few things. It's shown that, you know, it shows what we can do. So, you know, as, as staff supporting these the boards and committees, um, you know, we pick up on, you know, the way they handle certain items, the things that they're really focused on and care a lot about. And, um, you know, we're able to translate that and, and, and work that into our um, review of these applications over the last um, two years. And, you know, the, the, 
the condition, you know, conditions on a, um, on a restaurant, for example, you know, you're, you're dealing with things like um, number of staff, um, hours of operation, trash and recycling management, uh, crowd control, uh, you know, um, ID uh, checking if there's alcohol being served, um, circulation within the space, um, noise from any live entertainment or pre-recorded entertainment. Um, and it really becomes almost like a checklist of things that you go through. And it's a different checklist for a cafe than it is from a, uh, uh, you know, a nightclub or a restaurant that's open till 1 a.m. So I think we've learned that you know, we're really good at reviewing these things because we also then inspect. So even after um, you know, the zoning board spends a couple of nights working out the issues of a permit and granting a special permit, we're then charged with you know, seeing it through. Uh, and, and inspecting the, the work that's being constructed or altered. And then we also do regular inspections. Our, you know, our health department is in there twice a year to do inspections. Our fire department and building inspector uh, are doing joint inspections every year of these establishments. Uh, and sometimes there's other additional inspections um, you know, for, for the fire department um, safety requirements on the large capacity locations. So uh, we've, we've, I think we found that we can do this quickly, um, you know, it, without losing what is, um, you know, what we're trying to ensure is covered by the permit or set of conditions. Uh, and we, you know, when I say quickly, it still takes a lot of time. You know, an applicant will uh, spend weeks and sometimes months with staff before they even make the submission to the board. And then you're, you know, then you're worked into a schedule that you just talked about, you know, it might be five, six, seven weeks away for initial hearing. And then there's appeal period, you know, that follows before they can actually get their permit or authorization to use for use. And, you know, what we hear over and over again is that this is not only the time involved is, uh, you know, uh, concerning, it's costly. Uh, the application process, the notification that needs to go out through the butters, um, the uh, professional consultants, although, you know, not having to drive to Amherst at the moment probably saves them quite a bit. But, you know, usually the team would show up in the town room for one or two nights. And, you know, all that combined, you know, definitely you can see the strain, you know, the wear and tear, you know, on the applicant in some of these cases. And I do feel like we're able to, you know, look for another option. You know, it's not uncommon. Other communities, Northampton allows restaurants in the downtown by right, you know, so not even a site plan, just a yes, you know, and, and I think, you know, by now we know this, the restaurants are, you know, what makes downtown happen right now. And, you know, we get five, six routinely, you know, coming in and out every year we have for the almost 10 years that I've worked here. Uh, so that's probably not going to change. So it's, you know, to me, it was worth, you know, considering, you know, the lesser path for to get to the place, the same place that we want to be uh, with, with these permits. Well, you and your team have done an amazing job. I, have, I, I feel like all these outdoor eateries are like the silver lining of COVID that we kind of got to that. <laughs> we you. might not have gotten that, you know, without. So that's one thing I think everyone in Amherst agrees on. <laughs> that it's been a success. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Shalini. Yeah, I would agree that I think I agree with these changes that Rob is recommending and it will really help to shift the narrative that our town is hard and cumbersome to start small business in. And then one thing that I wanted to bring up was the inspection criteria themselves. Like I wonder if some like we want to have really high standards of inspection but revisiting them to see if they need to be revised. For example, this is a very old example of uh, a hairdresser that I used to go to in Amherst and she moved out and said she went to Hadley because the inspection requirements were so much higher, like requiring, for example, a copper wash basin versus it being stainless steel. In, which is equally hygienic, but, you know, and, and that's, it may not, I may be totally distorting the story, but you know what I'm saying? Like the criteria, which, because we have newer materials or whatever, they may have changed. So this might be a good opportunity to also revisit the inspection criteria. And um, 
the other thing that I was thinking was also as we are designing or thinking, rethinking the criteria to again bring in the climate action lens and social justice lens. I know it doesn't automatically come to my mind, but I'm just thinking like if we're looking at lighting or things like that, and maybe even inviting um, either Stephanie, who is already in our staff, to take a look because when they look at it, they can instantly say, oh, here, 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 we can put in some criteria that may not be burdensome, but it's like a win-win for everyone. And similarly for social justice, um, I know that the bid has been working really closely with Hazel and, you know, just like people who have a different language or whatever, and this may not be related at all to the conversation we are having, but I just thought that I'll keep bringing that up. I remember Darcy used to do that and she's not here, but uh, I'm hoping to be that person and all of us be that person that we keep bringing back the environmental and the social justice lens as we make these changes. Thank you, Shalini. Um, what I have heard from the committee is um, that, at, at least briefly, I haven't obviously heard from everyone that this is potentially a path we might want to pursue. So my question to, to Rob and Chris right now is, would you be um, um, more comfortable if this sort of a, sort of endorsement of pursuing the path, right? Obviously, there's no you know approval or anything right now. This is just a conversation to discuss and see a path forward. Um, if that would come from the town council through sort of how we did the zoning priorities last year of a direction to the town manager to work on this, would that make you more comfortable if we brought that to the council and then asked the council to make a vote? Would it be more comfortable if just CRC said, hey, we think this is a great path to go? What, what would you like to see? Because I'm thinking maybe we can figure out a motion today based on our conversation if this committee is ready to um, get you whatever sort of um, support you're hoping for from either CRC or the council to move forward um, on something like this. Chris. Um, I would be a little concerned if it went to the council in the sense of bring it to the council, then the council says, um, you know, we'll refer this to X body and come back in 90 days. Because I think, you know, at this point in the year, we don't really know all the different things we're going to be working on and to put um, deadlines on us, I think is, uh, would be challenging. I don't know how Rob feels about that, but I would prefer to just have um, kind of a sense of your going along with this and then we will work on it. And when it's ready, you know, we would bring it to you and then it could start on its normal path to town council and then going out to the um, whatever the appropriate committee is. That's my feeling. Rob? Yeah, yeah, I was, you know, that's, um, I, I was going to suggest something similar and it, you know, if the CRC is, you know, uh, has time and, and able to work on this that we could, you know, we could bring it to you first, you know, and show you drafts and work through some of the questions. I mean, you brought this up and called, you know, asked us to come and, you know, that's great, but we, you know, we want to do this, uh, present this change, but maybe we can work through it with the CRC first uh, before kind of falling into a, a formal process with deadlines and referrals. And, you know, I'm sure along the way we can, you know, also um, uh, bounce it off the planning board in an informal way for advice and you know update uh before it comes to them for for review too so yeah that if that worked we, you know we could work on this get it into our schedule chris and i can work uh you know on getting drafts together uh, and then when they're ready to to talk about we could ask to for some time here jennifer and that was kind of my question at what is the protocol in terms of it going to the planning board of uh, the planning board or the zoning board of appeal? Would that? So, uh, I'll attempt to answer that one because we've tried over <laughs> the last three years to figure out a, a process. And um, so, so how some of the, and, and what I'll use is it's not a set process. I will say that despite having flow charts that I can point you to of how things might work, um, it's, it's sort of still a process in, evolving process. Um, 
how things like the mixed use buildings that made it through the council in the last year, the apartments, the ADUs, um, the planning department staff worked on some changes, brought them to both the planning board and the CRC committees um, uh, for before a formal referral for hearing for discussion of drafts um, as they were being developed, as the changes were being developed. And then when the two boards either hit um, sort of hit their own sort of, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but um, sort of end of commenting, I would say, even if those boards disagreed on those commenting, at some point the planning staff said, we're not, we're not progressing with a draft. We, we're where we want to be. We're going to bring it to the council for that formal referral for hearing recommendation and eventual vote. Then it went went to the council, made those recommendations. Then it went for the hearings and all. Um, and so that that was a process that, I mean, as chair of CRC, I would say um, had some difficulties, but also worked. <laughs> we're, we were working through things like when the comments from the planning board and CRC differ, the planning staff's in a quagmire, you know, <laughs> who do they go with? So, so there were some difficulties um, that, that still need worked out, but I, I think that for some of the stuff worked well and for some of the amendments didn't work as well is what I would say. So there's no set process. We're still working on how to do this, um, but those, those particular items were specifically worked on after the council um, told, directed the manager on what the council zoning priorities were. So that would be a difference than what would be going on here. If we decide to say, you know, the, the process that Chris and Rob just laid out, I would definitely report that to the council. I would report it in a, a physical report, a written report, and also an oral report um, uh, with some requests that if there's counselors that you know, really object to something like that, please let me know so I can bring that back to CRC so that we're not, the, the goal is we're not working on things that don't have any shot of passing the council. That doesn't mean something will automatically pass a council, but, but we don't want something that is only supported by three counselors, the planning staff to be working on a lot because you need nine votes most of the time. So, so if there would be a lot of opposition somewhere other than CRC, as chair, I'd want to know so that I can talk to the planning staff or talk to the council president about, oh, maybe we do need a council conversation. Um, Pam and then Pat. Thanks. Um, I would I would like to see the role of CRC as being, this seems like a very logical process to go through. It looks like there's some really rational reasons to update table three. Um, we'd like to keep some flexibility in our administrative reviews of certain things. And, um, but that, that the, some of the working parts and pieces really seem like they should go to the planning board and the planning, bo planning board designee like zoning subcommittee or something where there's just some hands-on work that fleshes out uh, a document that, that we can then come back and look at. I, I don't feel like the CRC should be involved in each of the little details at this level. And I think that's the role of the planning board. I thought it was the, plan, the role of the planning board. But I'd be very happy to lend my support tonight to have that go ahead, however we want to craft that. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Pat. Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel very comfortable going forward with Rob and Chris's suggestion about them working on it and then as they uh, as they're ready sharing and having CRC reflect on it. Um, I haven't thought so much about what should happen with the planning board, but I one of the things that I get frustrated with is how complicated and it is to get something done. And so we have two people here saying we want to go forward. We think, you know, from what we've learned, from what we've been doing, we've got some clear ideas. And they're saying, let us take the time frame we need and then share that with you. And I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to really see it come from them. And Shalini. 
Yeah, I think we had agreed that there are three different ways that bylaws, zoning bylaws can change. One is coming from the planning staff and one is from CRC and one is from planning board. And I think this is initiative is being led by the staff and you know we just want you all to know that we fully support that. And I think where I personally do think that I'm totally okay with uh, what's been suggested by Rob and Chris, but like what Pat was say, um, Pam was saying that I think uh, planning board brings its own unique skill sets and experiences. So bringing them in for those aspects that they you know that they have more expertise than we have in crc so so i i don't think it's going to be a problem i think we we can just start working on it and when we feel like we need to move it forward to the planning board we can uh, you know pass it to them for that part just let's get let's get started okay so so what i'm hearing is um oh, well pam oh, go I'm first pam and then i'll summarize okay I was going to say, I'm, I'm ready to pass it to the planning board. I think that's where the nuts and bolts should be happening. And if we took a motion tonight to, to make, you know, that make that move, I'd be very happy about that. If that's how you want to structure it. Okay. So what I was actually going to suggest is I think we might not need a particular motion at all. Um, it, I think we've heard that this committee is supportive of something happening on the planning department's timeline. Um, I was going to suggest that given what I've heard about planning board information or input, not information, input from the planning board, potentially before the CRC or as a potentially different type of input than CRC would offer, that um, I will be in touch with Chris, Rob, and um, as they go forward, I think what we're saying is go forward with what Rob suggested, um, work on it on the timeline that fits into you guys' schedule knowing that we don't want to have to extend temporary zoning in December. So, so in some sense, there is a deadline, but that deadline is to not have to extend temporary zoning, if, if at all possible. Um, but that I will work with Chris and Rob um, and Doug as planning board chair, Dave Zomek, to figure out what the best sort of flow and types of comments where CRC might best um, contribute to the development or you know comment on the development and the drafts versus where the planning board and what that timeline is i'll work with pam the vice chair of this committee to figure all of that out and we'll have that conversation as it's coming out of staff and they're seeking feedback to figure out which place at which time is the best place to get that feedback from this committee does that sound like a plan or does this committee really want to take a vote <laughs> Shalini just gave me a heads up, a finger, a thumbs up for that plan. Um, others, is that a good one? Uh, Jennifer, uh, unmute, please. Right, right. In terms of the planning board, um, would it, uh, I mean, could there ever just be a report or just so they know what we're doing? Is that something that it would be appropriate to do at this time? So. I would personally hope that Chris or Rob upstates the planning board on what they're working on zoning wise in that sense. Um, Chris and then Rob and then Pam. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Pam. Um, I, I would, if I was going to ask if Chris and Rob feel more comfortable having a vote from us in order to proceed I was told in my one-on-one -on -one with Paul Bockelman at the very beginning that they really didn't like to work on things unless they had a motion, a second, and a, and a vote. And if that makes them comfortable, then just tell us yes, and I would be happy to make a motion. Rob and Chris, do you want a motion? Chris. I don't think we need a motion unless Rob does. I feel like we've had this conversation. It's going to get into the minutes and it's been a public meeting. We have two members of the public here. And so it's um, it's sort of out there that you agree that we can work on this. And I don't think we need a motion. Rob? I agree. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, before you. you go, I'm going to move to public comment in case so I, I think your particular part is done for today, but if you have the time, please stay for public comment in case anyone who's making public comment 
has a comment related to Article 14 versus some other issue. And um, so at this point, we're going to move on to public comment. Um, if you are public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC are going to be accepted right now for up to three minutes a person. Um, if you would like to make a public comment at this time, please raise your hand and I will recognize you in turn. Seeing no hands, we're going to close the opportunity for public comment at this time. Thank you so much, Rob, for joining us today to talk about Article 14. We look forward to um, seeing the results of that, at least by the end of the year, hopefully, um, and in whatever way Pam and I and further discussions um, outside of meetings for scheduling purposes happen. So thank you so much, Rob. And um, at this time, we're going to move on to transition memo, um, a general discussion. We started last meeting with a discussion of um, or an update on design guidelines. Um, and but there's a bigger part than just design guidelines, obviously, in the transition memo. Um, and so we're going to move to um, that discussion. Um, I'm gonna basically, we had two documents, let, actually, let me do it this way. We had two documents in the packet, the actual transition memo, and then Chris Brestrup was kind enough to provide us with an update or status, I guess it was an Excel sheet that gave a status of the zoning priorities that the council voted last year. Um, and where they were, this was a document that was provided to the planning board at the request of the planning board chair. And so she provided it to me and I thought it might be helpful to this committee um, to see. Um, I'm gonna offer Chris the opportunity if she would like to, to go through it um, or say anything about those priorities that she would potentially like. Um, and then I'm just gonna open the transition memo discussion up to the committee. Um, I as chair don't really have any thoughts on where this discussion might go so i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it up to those who wanted it on the agenda um to to sort of help guide the discussion so first chris so i'm happy to go through this um spreadsheet if you think it would be helpful i think it might be because we were given a a slate of things to work on and many of the things we did work on, some of which we had actually got passed by the town council and some of which we didn't. So if you think it would be helpful, Mandy Jo, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but I can't share my screen. So I, I can share the screen. Um, I'm gonna ask our committee members, would they like um, Chris to specifically go through the Excel sheet? Um, and if anyone, does um, please raise your hand and or you know raise your hand if you want it specifically gone through. If not, we will just open up to questions and discussions, not just about the Excel sheet, about the transition memo in general. Um, so I think, given that I'm not seeing any hands, that we might be able to avoid a specific rundown of the Excel sheet and move on to just discussion and any any questions on not just the Excel sheet transition memo or anything people want to say um, about transition and thoughts about what I guess the last CRC and the council then thought we potentially should discuss um, or keep on or not. Um, Chris, you have raised your hand. I have, yeah. I just okay. wanted to um, give a sentence or two about things that the planning department and the planning board um, need to work on. And um, I thought you might be interested in those things and then we can kind of fit the other things around it. Um, yeah. So in terms of um, you know need to work on, flood maps are very important. And I'm hoping that we are finally coming into the home stretch. I've been talking to the town council about flood maps ever since 2018, but in fact, the planning department has been talking about them since 2012. That's when we started working on this project. We've finished, uh, we've gotten through the last um, appeal process uh, that ended on December 9th, and we did not receive any appeals. And um, my understanding is now that um, FEMA is going to issue a letter of final determination um, sometime 
we're expecting it in March and um, it will be sent to Lynn Griesmer and um, I believe I'll receive a copy. Um, and that means that FEMA is happy with the flood maps. Um, and then we need to start this six month compliance period. And the six month compliance period um, includes um, explanation to the town council, what is this project all about? presenting the flood maps to you. And then there's a component of um, text that we're going to have to include in the zoning bylaw. And right now, Nate Malloy is tasked with the job of working on that text. And he's going to be putting it together and um, bringing it to the planning board and bringing it to you. Um, what we're expecting is that we'll have a presentation. I think it's going to be on February 28th to um, kind of bring you all up to speed on the flood map project, because I'm sure that people who heard about it in, in probably early 2019 uh, are not remembering it as as well as they did the week after they heard about it. Anyway, so so that is a really important project. And the reason it's so important is because if the board, if the council doesn't adopt the new flood maps, then we won't be in the flood insurance rate um, system anymore. So people whose properties are subject to flooding won't be able to get flood insurance. So this is really important and we need to pay attention to it and we need to um, you know make sure that the town council adopts the maps and the text so that's in my opinion number one number two would be the solar bylaw and the solar assessment and we've been talking a lot about that internally and um, I spoke with the planning board about it yesterday last night um, that's going to take some effort we're hoping to hire a consultant we will hire a consultant to work with us to um, look at land in Amherst to determine where is it appropriate to put solar installations. Um, <clears throat> and this is going to involve, you know, a lot of um, analysis of really the whole town and, you know, figuring out which lands can uh, accept such a thing, which lands does it make sense to put it on? We can't put it in the wetland. We probably can't put it on APR land. So there are gonna be a lot of limitations, but that's one aspect to it. They call that the solar site assessment. Then we also need to come up with a solar bylaw, which will be part of the zoning bylaw, which will um, set out criteria for how um, solar installations can be uh, approved either by the planning board or by the zoning board of appeals. And they will probably be allowed in most zoning districts, um, but they will be, uh, we're hoping to create a map that will become part of the zoning bylaw that will show where it's appropriate to have these solar installations. So that was brought to us um, by Councillor DeAngelis and um, Councillor Griesmer. They felt that was important enough to um, just to initiate a solar moratorium. The moratorium, if it passes, will probably end in May of 2023. So we have to work on that pretty, we have to work on the solar bylaw and the solar mapping pretty rigorously this year. It's gonna involve a lot of public uh, input. Um, and then we have demolition delay, which we started to talk to town council and the CRC about last year. Um, it didn't get Eric or get very far. I don't actually think we brought it to town council, but we did bring it to CRC and the planning board. And this has to do with preservation of our historic uh, buildings in town. And um, it's very important to, uh, to figure out how to do that appropriately. We have a bylaw that is kind of out of date and we really need to update that. So last night we had a presentation to the planning board about the demolition delay bylaw, which we're now calling preservation of significant buildings, I believe. Um, but that's gonna take a fair amount of work and, um, and we wanna get that done soon. We also have this big project that thank you for uh, approving Thank you to the town council for last year for approving the money to allow us to do this, but we're going to be working on design guidelines and um, design standards for downtown. And I know many people are very eager that we, uh, excuse me, I don't know why my phones are ringing. I must be a very important person. Um, so anyway, uh, we, we recognize the importance of this um, this project, we've got an RFP that we're working on. We're hoping to get the RFP out, you know, 
maybe it'll take us four weeks, maybe it'll take us six weeks, but certainly by the end of this spring, we're hoping that we have a consultant in place on that. And that's, again, going to be a really big project with a lot of public forums, you know, having meetings of the public to get their input on things and, um, you know, and trying to figure out with our consultant um, how far does this go? Does this go all the way to UMass? And does it go to the railroad line on Main Street? And does it go as far south as Amherst College? Or what's the area that we're focusing on? And then um, are we going to divide it into sub areas? And does each sub area get treated differently? And so it is a, a huge project. So those four things are going to take up a lot of time of the planning department and the planning board. So I just wanted to set that stage for you because when we start talking about other things, you know, if we talk about smaller things, that's one thing. But Mandy Jo and others will remember that when we talked about something that we thought was relatively small and straightforward last year, say, you know, eliminating footnote M from the RG district, it just, you know, went big. It was a big <laughs> issue. And, um, also the BL district, dealing with the BL district and how to get more residential units into BL. So these things that we consider, oh, you know, that's a pretty small project, really blossom. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that you knew about those four things that were that are really important to the planning department and the planning board, things that we feel like we have to work on. We don't have a choice. And so um, all the other things will have to be kind of like you know, nested in around those. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that summary, Chris. That was actually really helpful for me um, and hopefully for the other committee members. So um, at this time, committee members, comments, thoughts about transition memo and other things. Pam. That's a that's a hefty list, even even though it's just four items. It's it's a it's a load. I can I know exactly what's going to happen here, um, and I'm I'm really appreciative of the fact that uh, preservation bylaws getting discussed and uh, and the solar the solar bylaw, which I think will people have been con very concerned that it will slow things down. But my gut feeling is is that um, once it's in place, it'll allow processing to happen much more rapidly because there'll be some good guidelines. So I think that truly is a, an important one. Um, and then the design guidelines, I am very happy to hear that that's happening. Um, and I think um, to be very honest, there's so many of the other residual zoning topics that, that were on the list that were brought up before, but they really are, um, they're really secondary to having the guidelines established. So, so having hearing that, um, you know, priority number four is design guidelines and standards. Uh, that's very complex, but I think again, if we do a reasonably good job with that, it too will help us. I think kind of move through some of the the finer details more quickly in the long run. So it's kind of take our time to do it right, and that'll help us in the long run. So thanks, thanks for that ambitious schedule. Jennifer. Um, thank you. Um, and I do, you know, uh, echoing what Pam said, that's those four items are a heavy lift. Um, so it was is really helpful hearing that. Uh, I maybe get jumping too much into the weeds right now, but um, just when I read the transition memo, I guess what popped out for me is I just, hope we can be mindful of maybe not doing it piecemeal, but having a holistic approach to the items that we decide if, you know, that we're going to carry over from the last council session. Because as I was reading through, I mean, like I saw on the um, September 29th email that from last year on page four, it talks about, um, you know, lifting the cap on apartments and that, you know, in the RG district, because of the dimensional table regulations, you know, that there shouldn't be a worry if the cap is lift because, you know, it still required that there be a certain, you know, number of acreage per size of the building. But then kind of when you read the November 30th memo, 
It talks about changing the dimensional regulation tables. So my concern is just if, if we do it piecemeal and don't do it holistically, that the justification for some changes because there's protections in place, but if we lift those protections, then you know we the, the justification for making the initial change is no longer there. So I would just, you know, when we get to the point more in the weeds where we're looking, you know, at exactly, you know, which items we're going to carry over, that we have that holistic approach because there's, you know, some things that kind of contradict each other when we get into the fine print. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Shalini. Yeah, talking about a holistic approach, um, there is a framework called multi solving. And the idea is that we uh, focus on solutions that solve multiple problems at the same time. And, you know, we all have agreed as a town council, at least, which reflects the town residents that uh, we have certain goals in mind, like, let's say, affordable housing, uh, environment and climate change, social justice, um, you know, just to name a few. So when we are applying a lens to these solutions and what we're doing, I think it's important to keep in mind and economic development, maybe that's the fourth one. So keeping in mind all of these uh, and seeing, um, and I think that is what we were doing uh, without saying so publicly, but I think making it public, like how, what is the framework we're using to think about these and, and how they solve all these different issues, um, I think will give us some sort of structure and a shared language um, and process to move forward. Thank you, Shalini. Pam. Yeah, I forgot to mention one of the other items that, that has been on the books um, is a, sort of a, a broadening view of the parking parking requirements downtown, parking opportunities downtown. And I know the um, the parking facility overlay district uh, was passed last December, and I think there were a number of councilors at that time who spoke up and said, "Yeah, I'm supporting this now, but I really do also want to have a a more inclusive look at the other pers any other parcels, including the Boltwood Garage, as part of that package uh, for the the capacity and." Um, opportunity for parking facilities. So we look beyond just the one parcel to whatever the town can offer from that. And it, that is something that um, may tie into the design guidelines or at least the discussion of what we want the downtown to look like. But I, I do want to give a heads up to the planning staff and Dave that um, you know that's something that I think is going to be coming down the pike as well, and it might it might be a little bit like the solar bylaw, but um, so just to put it on the books and make a note of that. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, Mandy. No, and and thank you, Bam, for for bringing up that reminding us about that parking piece. Um, I had the opportunity actually to spend an hour with Rob and Chris this morning, and and kind of did a primer on this very conversation. So I think Chris really, you know, really summarized things quite well. And I guess my my thoughts on this transition memo too are, are I guess I'm hoping, Mandy, that, you know, the transition memo and, and your communication with Lynn um, and Anna and, and other council members is, you know, I think it's really imperative that we all think about you know, what is the collective workload, both of the council, but also of staff. So, you know, as, as and, and this is our exact list that we talked about three hours ago, Rob and Chris and I, uh, with a few additions, actually, flood maps, um, a demo delay, which is now the, the new name, and I didn't write down the whole thing that the Historical Commission now calls it, but preservation bylaw, if you will, uh, solar bylaw, siting study, design guidelines, form-based code, we have parking, as Pam, you summarized just a moment ago. We also know that the council is interested in some changes to the rental uh, uh, bylaw, the, the rental permitting. So we're beginning at the in January of February now, 
um, to, to put together this work, work plan, if you will, for the council, which translates into a work plan, at least what I see here for the conservation and development functional area. So I just wanna kind of be mindful of how much we're proposing to take on. We learned some lessons with seven zoning uh, amendments in, in 2021 and, and kudos to everybody who, who moved those all forward and, and did all that work. But it was a tremendous amount of work for the board, lots and lots of additional meetings for the CRC, the, the town council, and especially the planning board. The planning board, I don't, I think the planning board may have set a record for the number of meetings they had in 2021. So I think we need to think about workload. We also need to think really carefully about scheduling and sequencing because there's a, there's, you know, you can get some of these things on the tarmac, if you will, or a plane taking off, but there's a number of steps that need to happen. Chris mentioned one of them, say, with the uh, solar, um, well, with the design guidelines or the solar bylaw, we actually need to hire people to bring them on board to work with us. The solar siting study, we need to bring somebody on board to work with us. So I think it's imperative that we really, I hope, work with Lynn and and. I don't know if this is on your retreat schedule for the 12th, but really look at the next 12 to 16 months at least and say, how do we chart a path forward? Because my worry is we put too many things um, on our collective plates and then things get stalled, they get referred. Can we keep up with, with the pace? So just putting out a cautionary, let's, let's do some planning here before we launch on any one thing. Um, but it's an exciting list, no doubt about it, and things we need to get done for the community. Thanks, Dave. Chris. Um, I wanted to mention in regard to what Pam brought up about parking, that um, the planning staff has put in a request for um, some money for from the capital budget. I forget if it's 20 or 30,000, I think it might be 30. But anyway, it's for the purpose of evaluating um, Boltwood Garage and to see if it can um, can accommodate an, another story or two. Um, you know, we need to look at that structurally to determine. I know it was originally designed to hold a, at least one more story, but um, we don't know if that will um, meet today's structural requirements, et cetera. So we've, we've put that money in the capital request um, and we hope that we will get that money and be able to hire a consultant to do that. In terms of the other, um, I think there was another location on Amity Street that was uh, looked at and that may be more, um, you know, kind of a, a something that the planning department can look at if, um, if we are asked to look at it. And, uh, you know, we can spend some time trying to figure out how many spaces might be able to go there, what the circulation pattern might be, um, et cetera. So, you know, that's a project that we could conceivably take on. Um, again, I would want to hear that somebody, namely CRC or a town council or somebody thought that was a good idea for us to do, and then we would um, spend the time on it. Thank you, Chris. So I've been listening. Um, it's quite the list. And as Dave said, I myself am quite mindful of how much work um, we put on the planning staff last year um, with those zoning priorities. And, and it wasn't just the planning staff, as Dave said, it was planning board, it was CRC, it was, it was everyone. Um, and I, I'm not sure I want to repeat that crazy schedule. <laughs> so, so hence you'll hear my questions. Some of my questions are about capacity and ability to do stuff and all. Um, but you know, there's certain things that I'd like to see. I'm looking at the transition memo, and and there's one thing that wasn't really on the transition memo that um, is part of the referral that we have to deal with, and this will probably be part of our next meeting for CRC, but. I'd, I'd like the planning staff to be thinking about it potentially for the next meeting is our comprehensive housing policy that the council passed. Um, because, you know, everything that's been talked about so far doesn't necessarily address the need for more housing. And I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm not saying it does, but, but 
one of the things CRC in terms of the referrals we have was to refer the Council Comprehensive Housing Policy to CRC for implementation. So one of the things we have to start and, and to the manager um, for implementation. And so one of the things we have to start talking about is what is getting implemented? What's that timeline? What's the first focus? What's the second focus? What departments are those focuses and things like that? Um, and obviously we haven't had that conversation, but as CRC, I would like to see CRC working on implementing or figuring out a plan for what the council's role in implementing comprehensive housing policy is or what other departments that might have capacity that aren't necessarily the planning department, right? Because there might be things that can be done that aren't focused on planning department or centered in planning department. So that's a conversation for next time, but I want us to start thinking about, we're not just zoning. We're also housing. Um, we're also um, sustainability per our charge. Um, and are there things we can be doing there that aren't necessarily planning department that deals with what Shalini was saying about um, solutions to solve multiple problems. Um, in looking at the transition memo, beyond that housing policy item of are there zoning things that could fit into capacity wise, um, there was some conversation topics to have and I'd love to hear the committee's thoughts on these conversation topics to see whether we want to have those conversations or whether we should sort of let those fall by the wayside or, or drop them versus the zoning priorities because I know we've been stuck on them and one of them is um, economic development and use of public space. This may not be, a, it, it's probably not solely a CRC item. It may be a TSO item. A CRC may say it belongs solely in TSO. Um, North Pleasant Street in summers on the weekends or throughout for outdoor dining for other outdoor spaces. Um, you know, there were a couple other things in here that deal do with, do deal with zoning, but um, small starter homes that deals with that. But of these conversation topics, I, I know I've always been interested in outdoor dining and outdoor spaces and use there. Is that something we want to pass off to TSO? Do we want to have those conversations now? Um, you know, and, and then I'd like to know whether the planning department thinks they have any capacity for anything other than what was mentioned today, <laughs> such that if we discuss something with housing that might need a zoning bylaw change, or if at a retreat, the council comes up with some other zoning issues, is there capacity or do you think there's capacity? And if not, um, who might have capacity or not, right? Um, so that's my other question, particularly to Dave and Chris is, is there even any other capacity versus what you just listed for anything additional that the council may come up with as a priority? And then to my committee members, things about the, the conversation topics. Uh, Chris and then Dave. So I wanted to just mention that um, uh, in the comprehensive housing policy, there are a number of strategies that um, some of which we are already working on and some of which we've already accomplished. For instance, one of them was to pass a more robust inclusionary zoning bylaw. So we've already done that. So I think, you know, if we go through the comprehensive housing policy, we can go through it and say, oh yes, we're working on that. Um, you know, the Belchertown Road um, East Street School Project, that's a huge um, uh, effort to, uh, you know, provide more affordable housing. Um, we're, we're always seeking out spots for more affordable housing. We will probably get another, well, anyway, I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole, but I just wanted to say that of that uh, comprehensive housing policy, if we went through it one by one, we could probably say, yeah, done that, done that, done that, are, we, are doing this. And so I think that's information that um, I would like to share with you. Um, the other thing is, sure, we have, we're not only going to be working on these uh, four things, um, but we also have permitting responsibilities. So we need to consider, you know, balancing the permitting responsibilities and the projects and the zoning. And when, you know, something comes in, like, I'm going to give you an example, 132 Northampton Road, um, that was the um, Valley CDC project to house 28 um, formerly homeless or low income people. That took a tremendous amount of work on the part of the planning department, going to meetings, Nate, Maureen, me, Rob, 
and you know over months at a time so we don't know if we're going to get something like that probably not on that scale probably we haven't heard of any um well no that's not true belchertown road and east street school that's going to be the same kind of thing so when that comes in the door and it becomes a zoning board uh, special permit application comprehensive permit application excuse me that's going to take all hands on deck focusing on that making sure it gets done right so um you know yes we have zoning and yes we have projects like the north common that we're going to be working on but we also have these kind of unknowns in terms of permitting and they kind of you know just walk in the door when they when they want to um so we have to i can't look ahead i can't i don't have a crystal ball about which um kinds of projects like that are going to come to us in the next year but that's all part of the the capacity that we have to do things so if i say yeah we have the capacity to do four other zoning amendments and then some big comprehensive permit comes in you know that kind of goes um out the window so i just wanted to make you aware of that and by the way just to also make you aware um you'll be the first to know we did receive four uh, preliminary subdivision applications for um, Coles properties up in North Amherst. We received them today, so we're going to be looking at those and bringing those to the planning board. Um, but that's, you know, that's another big thing that we have to work through. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it shares my my thought process. So that, that certainly helped, Chris. Um, Dave, you lowered your hand. I'm confused. I, like to, <laughs> I was. You can I make a comment if you do. I was just confused because you lowered it. Transition. So, let me first just say a bit about um, about housing and and um, you know we we've we've talked about the um, you know the comprehensive housing policy and implementation of that and and as Chris said, you know we're already working on that. I mean, there's a lot of exciting things happening on the housing front that yes, are coming out of the, all the discussions we've had over the last couple of years with regard to housing. But, um, you know, as Chris mentioned, you know, we're, we're, we're poised to move forward with East Street's, uh, the East Street School site and Belchertown Road site. There'll be some announcements coming in the, in the weeks ahead on that. Um, we're looking at, um, we're assessing town land that we currently own that could be used for affordable housing. Um, Rob and I in particular are working on some very creative options uh, that have come on the radar screen in the last month or two or three uh, for potential other projects. You may recall that we took a very, um, you know, somewhat um, bold and aggressive step to go after the uh, Belchertown Road uh, property. We paid about $730,000 for that and combined uh, East Street School site and the Belchertown Road site into one RFP. We are, uh, the town is now, um, uh, assessing those responses to that RFP, we're 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 very excited about where we are in that process. And um, as Chris said, that will result in a 40B process that th the town needs to manage. Um, we also have the ARPA funds, so there are there's two million dollars in ARPA funds that we need to move forward on. There's one million for housing, and there's one million for homelessness, and and there may be some some. You know, interaction between those funds and opportunities we have uh, with land and, and buildings in town. So I feel very good about um, where we are with with the with the comprehensive housing plan. We're not sitting back on our on our on our hands waiting for direction on that. We're moving forward. So the short answer to Mandy's question of a few moments ago, I think Chris is so diplomatic and and very optimistic. I honestly think, and, and we talked about this, Chris, Rob, and I a couple of hours ago, we have enough work to do for the next six months. I, I am really cautious and hesitant to add, to say we have capacity to add other things. If something's got to fall off the wagon here, we, we are going to be going full tilt for the next six months to just get what we've talked about in the last 30 minutes initiated and started. It doesn't mean that any of those are going to be done in six months, but hiring consultants, 
moving forward with the, the zoning articles, all of the, the things um, you know, that we talked about all, around the edges, all these studies, and in addition, as Chris mentioned, um, just the, um, the, the uh, regulatory work that we need to do when applicants uh, apply. Um, so I think the plate is very full right now, unless something falls off the, the plate or the wagon, as uh, we shall say. Um, we have enough work to do that'll take us well through, you know, into the summer. So I'm just cautious about adding more. Thank you for that, Dave. Um, Pat. Uh, first of all, Chris and, and Dave and Rob, I don't know if he's still there, but thank you for your work. Um, I don't think that gets said enough. Uh, and um, one of the things that I'm not sure I'm, where exactly I'm going with this as a question, but one of the things that happened with 132 North Hampton Road was rather intense resistance from neighbors. You can see pro or con that same kind of intense reaction by neighbors to um, the solar siting in on Shootsbury Road. You can you we saw that Dave when we were trying to get land you know use the Amherst land. How in how do we how does the council take on more responsibility for filtering that in some way or addressing it? to leave you folks open to the work that you have to do for these things. I mean, I, I get, I'm, I'm, I've just been overwhelmed by resistance to change in our town. And, um, and so any advice on how CRC or any committee can begin to address our, uh, the community to, to allow change. And, and I don't mean the change I want versus the change this person wants, <laughs> but how do we do this in a collaborative way that benefits the town? And I just don't see that happening a lot. Dave. Happy to have Rob or Chris weigh in, but I guess my initial reaction, Pat, is what we can ask of you is to be the most informed you possibly can be on, and I don't want to use sides, but on, on the entire issue, whether it's solar, whether it's uh, citing affordable housing or citing a homeless shelter, whatever it might be that might elicit. Um, uh, and I don't like to use NIMBY. I, I rarely use that, that phrase. Elicit concern or, in, you know, we want engagement. We're a very engaged community, but I think too often in Amherst, there's misinformation that gets passed along and then it, it grows and it, it grows, it, it builds that concern. So I think what we, what we ask of you as our highest elected leaders is to simply be informed on all the issues. And if you don't know, um, send those people to us so we can get them the study or we can point them to the website or you can. There's lots of things on our website and as the planning board or zoning board or whatever board or committee or the conservation commission goes through their deliberations, there's so much information. And um, I think that's one way that you can help us to really kind of buffer and, and educate and engage people. Um, you know, um, I think the conservation commission over the last, again, I go to every one of their meetings, you know, um, They've been wonderful at, at just putting out that information relative to, say, the Shootsbury solar proposal that, that was recently before them, or the Eruptor project in North Amherst. And I think we had loads, you know, dozens of people attend those meetings, and they, they saw the information, they read the information, and, and I, I think it helped us really inform a broad range of people and, and make sure everybody who wanted to had access to that information. So that's my a quick answer that. Thank you very much, Dave. That's thank helpful you, Dave. to me. Yes, thank you for that. Um, Shalini. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous question. I think many of us have been uh, thinking about it, um, Pat. Uh, and my, uh, my feeling is that as elected leaders, we can role model what that looks like in how we have our discussions. And as Dave was saying, like, how do we learn from each other and all the different perspectives? I think we can 
shift the narrative like we are divided us versus them versus and shift that narrative into like wow we are so lucky we have so many different engaged people who really care about this town and and instead of coming in with trying to change like the curiosity can be without an agenda of changing but it's really curious like hey what did you learn about that oh my god and this is what i learned about the situation and when i spoke with this person and this person so I think uh, the retreat is going to be a really good place, I'm hoping, for us. And that's one of my priorities. I'll, I don't know if that's a policy thing that I shouldn't talk about. I don't know. But we're talking about it right now. So I guess I can. So we are invited to share our priority, what we want to discuss. In the, and that is one of my main things, is how do we create safe spaces where our most creative selves come in. I know each one of us who's running and is here has amazing gifts and experiences to share and perspectives to share. And how do we not, um, you know, suppress that, but bring it out. If anyone is hesitant to speak, you know, bring them up, bring them out. So that's one thing. And the other thing I was going to speak to that is like, there's a lot of burden on the staff to answer all the questions. And that's where I think we also want to uplift our committees that we have, like we have conservation committee, we have the environmental climate action committee, which is not just for energy, their car plan, which is a 125 page plan was very thoroughly done, just as an example, and it talks about buildings and transportation and land conservation. And so they do bring in a certain amount of expertise, not the whole thing. But we have these amazing committees that we don't even know exist, like I didn't know they even exist, like Human Rights Commission or you know, so like when we're talking about social justice and we don't know how to think about it, can we invite them to give us that lens and how to, you know, incorporate that? So that's what I'm envisioning. And that's what I think we're doing in TSO also is hoping to bring the uh, ECAC to our committee and say, this is our charge and these are some of the things we're working on. And how do we bring the climate action lens? And I think we did that manager, remember, for the housing policy, we had the ECAC people came and they were like brought up things that we could never have thought about. Like, oh, okay, that's how we're supposed to think about that. So I think bringing in these committees and all the expertise that we have in our town. Um, but thank you for asking that, Pat. It's a really good question. Anything else on the transition um, memo? Shalini. Okay. Just continuing with that. So the ECAC does have a 125 page plan and it does cover buildings in it, which I think might be related to our charge. So at some point, can we look at, uh, and that's something that we can do internally, right? Before we bring in the staff or anything, but just for us to look at what are some of the recommendations that they had with respect to and this transportation, which could go to TSO, I suppose, but it's like, how do we reduce the emissions and make more energy efficient buildings or whatever? So maybe inviting them to talk about how do we start implementing some of the strategies that they had. Further discussion on the transition memo? Pam. Looking at a couple of the items, um, the, the conversation topics that do kind of feel like they would go to something like TSO, the closing of the street, the weekends, um, the continuation of outdoor dining. I think those are certainly, it's kind of a public way issue and a conversation, and they certainly deal with that a lot more than we would. I would love to see that those two items just move on to that plate and not just sit here because I think they're great topics, but they probably won't get much action here. Um, the municipal parking district to me is, um, well, that's sort of wrapped into that whole, you know, are we studying the, are we studying all of the parking garage locations? How does that play into the municipal parking district, especially as we go forward? Um, so I think there are some in here that I don't want to I don't want to add to the workload, but there's there's some perhaps related to the topics that we've already discussed. Thanks, Pam.
I will say this has been helpful for me as I um, think about conversation topics, discussions as we move forward with agendas when there aren't as many um, referrals that we're dealing with on the immediate sort of basis. Um, so I thank you for that. I'll also write up a report on these conversations for um, the council. Um, I'm not sure whether that will be in the packet. I'm not sure I can get it done for Monday's packet, but I'll do a verbal report even if I can't get a written report done for Monday. Um, Chris. Oh, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, we don't mean to close the door on having conversations about things that we might work on in the future, just because we won't be able to work on them for a few months doesn't mean that we can't plan for, you know, July, and here's some things we're going to work on in July, um, and they might be like uh, all of those issues relating to housing apartments duplexes triplexes quadruplexes converted dwellings all of those things that we tried to work on last year and we just didn't we didn't have enough time so and there may be other things that you are particularly interested in so we are open to hearing about what you care about and what you want us to work on and then we can also share our ideas about what we would like to work on you know when the door opens and the you know, and things clear up a bit and we have a little more time. So we don't have to wait till July to talk about that. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, David. Yeah, the only other thing I would add, I guess, as, as I'm listening, and I think this has been a really good conversation is, you know, as, as we think about, um, and earlier in the conversation, there were a couple of mentions of, you know, doing business in Amherst and, and, and um, whether they're businesses, whether they're restaurants, whether they're retail, whether they're um, developers, whether they're homeowners, we all want processes that are transparent, that are efficient, um, that make sense and move our community forward. So I think, I think we should apply that I'm going out on a limb here a little bit. I think we should apply that to as best we can staff working with you, a, a, a council committee, and ultimately with the council, we should apply that same thinking to the work of the council and to the council's committees. Because if we take on too much, things get bogged down and the perception becomes reality, which is, you know, we've bitten off more than we can chew, that old saying, right? And things get bogged down and people can't follow the process and and, and things take months and months and months. So I think it's really important to have some sort of a work plan with you that makes sense and has realistic deadlines and, and timelines. Because we, we, you know, we wanna work with you and, and have, um, you know, have the public view this committee and the council as being efficient, uh, setting priorities, and uh, moving forward in a, in a rational and reasonable way. So I just think it's a, it's an outflow of good planning to really say, here's what we're gonna, here's what we're gonna undertake in 2022 and 23 and have some sort of a plan. And I just think that's a, a logical, we're doing that every day, but I think you are the outward highest elected officials, you know, in, in our community. And people look to you and say, what is the council doing? What are the important things you're working on to better our community? So just put that out there. Um, Thank you, David. Shalini and then Jennifer. Oh, for the RFP, uh, for the art design consultant for downtown, is it possible to include language that invites uh, consultants who have an environmental and you know racial justice focus and use inclusive processes like human centered approaches? which really because as we've seen we don't ever get all stakeholders we get you know a, a small group of people who are very active and we obviously want to continue inviting them but we also want to hire consultants and there are very creative ways to actually go into the community and engage people in different ways using different methodologies and not just these formal forums which many people are hesitant to come to or speak to so can that be part of the rfp that we invite consultants with human-centered design or similar approaches. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Um, I did want to thank and um, concur with Dave that if we could even start 
to put items that we want to address on the calendar for later in the year or even next year, because we are here for two years. I, um, so, you know, I think we all have items that are too much for the next six, maybe even to nine months, but that, you know, we can look a little further down the road. Um, I also wanted to, you know, was wondering, there's a lot of um, different groups of neighbors and streets, you know, that are starting to get together, you know, in districts all over Amherst. Um, and I'm wondering how we might engage, or if this committee is the appropriate committee to think about engaging with them as well, just, you know, to, I guess, see what the residents, you know, are their priorities in terms of housing and communities and economic development. And I guess, you know, again, I'm getting a little specific, but when I look at the comprehensive housing policy, like the goals, I think we would all agree on the goals, but I think it gets to, are these strategies for reaching the goals, you know, really going to get us to those goals or, you know, and I think a lot of people in the neighborhoods have some really great insights on kind of what's going on on the ground. But I think all with the goal of wanting to have an equitable community that is inclusive. So I'm just, I guess, trying to struggling with a little of how we maybe reach out to the community, their input, and then we develop kind of a vision of where we want to go instead of the other way around. We develop the vision and then take it to the community. Thank you. Um, Shalini. Um, I think that's an excellent idea. I wonder if we can frame the, frame the question for other counselors and share it out so that in the district meetings, we can you know have the same questions that we're putting out to our uh, residents and then we have a way of pulling all of that information and we'd be happy to share it later with the council once we've collected all that information and the second thing I was thinking around that is you know residents is definitely we want to hear because everyone has different lived experiences and just as an example you know being at the mobile market which actually Pat probably has way more experience than I do but uh, just a few times I went there and speaking with some of the volunteers who work there and one of them happened to have an urban planning um, degree from UMass and so I was like oh what do you think about this zoning in our town and he said the one single biggest problem we have in zoning in Amherst is it requires too much land to build houses so that makes it really expensive to build homes here in Amherst and he's, he's not able to afford living here and he's leaving to go to Holyoke now. So I'm just saying when we say that we have different perspectives, it's from our own lived experience and does not include the experiences of other people. And which is why it's really important, even the people who are coming to a district meetings are still, again, mostly a smaller group of people. So yes, we want to hear to them and that's not the only perspective of um, that's true for the people in that town. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna do some summary right now and next steps and move into that as we approach the end of our meeting. I think this has been a great conversation. Um, I think, I, I'm glad we did this before the retreat because I think it gives at least our committee some you know, Chris and Rob, I don't believe are going to be at the retreat. I believe zoning and sort of capacity and all will probably be a conversation, but that's just my guess. Um, and it will give us some background on capacity and ways to think about what is getting discussed at the retreat. When we hear from the retreat, we can come back and continue these conversations um, to talk about priorities, um, what the council wants to do, how that can fit into that work plan. Um, so that it's not, I think one of the things we probably erred on last year was everything was done at once and it wasn't, you know, sort of part of it was not stratified out enough, right? Like it was all grouped, grouped instead of here's the first set and then here's a second set and then here's a third set type thing. We didn't prioritize enough, I would say. And then we also put way too much stuff on you guys. <laughs> you know? And so I think we can continue these conversations with the housing policy as we um and and some of these other strategies as we move into the, our late february meeting and come back from the retreat um 
and listen at the retreat as a committee potentially and committee members to bring those discussions back here as we think about things to talk about with the council um, and within this committee. So um, with that, um, you know, that sort of previews the next agenda, right? Um, our next meeting is, I believe, I, I don't even, do I have my own calendar up? Um, today's Thursday. I think our next meeting is the 24th, um, I think is what I set it on. I'll look, but in, yes. um, with that, it means we have one more meeting before the 28th, but it is after the retreat. We won't have any new referrals as far as I know, um, because there's nothing on the agenda seeking referral to CRC. So, so we'll be dealing with my plan is to put conversation about the comprehensive housing policy implementation on that agenda. Um, I may continue this conversation as transition memo, including follow up from the retreat on that agenda. It will be an agenda that mostly deals with discussion of stuff. Um, not too many actions. We'll see how Monday goes. Um, in terms of discussion regarding Article 16, there is always, it didn't come from CRC. It didn't um, obviously originate in CRC or anything, but sometimes there are um, discussions that then the council sort of has a desire to have a committee come back and look at stuff. Um, if that is the case, and there is that sort of push after the first reading on Article 16, that would show up on the agenda. I'm not expecting it to, but I just want to put out there that if it is, that would take priority on an agenda based on a conversation at Monday's meeting and push some of these discussion topics off. But I'm not expecting that to be happen. Um, but we've seen that happen with comprehensive housing policy or some other policies before where things have been discussed. They come back to committee between two readings and then go back to the council after another reading um, for the second reading. So if that happens, it'll be on here. If not, we'll basically have another meeting where we're discussing stuff. Um, that's my plan. We should have minutes to pass next meeting. Um, and so we'll we'll deal with that too. Um, um, I think that's all I have for announcements and next agenda preview. Um, any next agenda items or announcements from the rest of the committee at this point? The none. Um, oh, Pat, on mute, please. I know we're nearing the end, and it, 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 um, and this is probably the inappropriate time, but I feel like this committee, uh, the five of us with Dave and Chris and and Rob here, but the five of us on the CRC, really represent a range of views. And I really value that. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. So now I'll shut up. Thank you for that, Pat. Um, always appreciate it. And, and I, I do happen to agree with you. I think this is a good committee representing a wide range of views um, that are represented in town in substantial numbers. So I, I'm hoping, I personally hope that that means we can accomplish a lot um, to get stuff done um, that relates to what this committee does in a way that is less contentious than has been in the past potentially. So that, that's potential, that's my hope um, based on that. But thank you for those comments. Any other announcements or next agenda items? Seeing none, um, we, I don't have any unanticipated items. I'm gonna ask as I always do if anyone else has any unanticipated items. Since no one else does, we are adjourning the meeting at 6.19 p.m. Thank you so much for a wonderful meeting today. Have a nice night.